Welcome, Mark. Thanks, Andreas. And welcome from me, too. Uh, my name is Mark Mutz. I work for the Qt company. And um, my talk today is about uh, coroutines as an API principle. So just um, before we start, I um, will use, as I announced in the abstract of the talk, um, I will use Qt types uh, for exposition and explaining things. Um, so before we start, I would like to just get a show of hands um, via the poll feature here um, that you should now see. Um, how many of you have experience with Qt so that I don't know, um, that I know how to um, gauge this in and um, how much of uh, the API to explain? Okay, it's still moving. I have no idea when it will finish. Let's just end it. Um, so about half of you have voted. So about a third uh, use it every day, about half uh, only superficially, and superficially it should have, good that you got that. Um, another 20% have heard of it, and 2% uh, have never heard of it. So, okay, um, I'll show results. Okay, so let's start. <clears throat> uh, we'll first start with an introduction, um, why this talk. Um, then we will recap um, the non-owning interface idiom, which uh, I presented four years ago um, on meeting C++17. And then we'll talk about the non-owning interface idiom version two, which will use coroutines. And then uh, later we'll tie it all together and uh, discuss uh, coroutines as an API principle. So why this talk? This talk is not a coroutine talk, at least not one that tells you how to write coroutines. I want to tell you why you want to write coroutines instead. If you want to know how to write coroutines, there is a lot of talks um, and papers and articles and blogs about this. And uh, from personal experience, I can recommend uh, Gor Nishanov's, uh, Nishanov's sorry, um, talks on YouTube, um, where he goes into various details um, um, about coroutines. He's one of the driving forces behind the standardization of the coroutine proposals. Uh, so he's the go-to guy for this. So why this talk, if not to tell you how to use coroutines? Um, I just deeply dislike owning containers in the API. And as someone coming from raw C++, you might think about, um, yeah, why does he say this? Where do we use owning containers in the SDL? Um, answer is we don't, uh, but Qt does. Qt API is full uh, of this API that takes and returns owning containers. Uh, for example, there's a control that's called label can show a bit of text on screen and that has a set text method takes a queue string queue string is like standard string except it's utf16 um, but it's owning it's an owning container right if you assign something some data to a queue string it allocates memory so what if my backend uh, library gives me a standard u16 string uh, it's already utf16 encoded so i should be able to just pass it in? No, nope. I need to call a function. So uh, what if I'm working for Bloomberg and I get a PMR U16 string instead? Um, yeah, there is a from standard U16 string, but eh, it does not work with custom allocators. So I need to use another function from UTF-16 and passing the data into size, and that's ugly especially because uh, here I'm running into this mismatch between the Qt containers, which use an signed integer type for sizes and the SDL, which uses an unsigned integer type. So uh, there's also something called crude gradient, which uh, represents a gradient that you can paint on screen, linear, radial, and so on. And of course, as a gradient, it has stops that define where, at which position, which color should be reached. And um, as such, there is a stops function that just returns you a vector of uh, gradient stops. 
and uh, Q vector is like standard vector, more or less. Um, so also an owning container. What if I just need the first two steps there, stops? I still get all of them. Then there's Q region. Q region is, a, is an abstraction of a bit mask, uh, um, a bit more efficient in that it's a collection of rectangles. Um, and this is used, for example, if you expose a window, you get paint events um, that tell you where in the window you're supposed to paint or uh, update. And um, that is uh, represented by a Q region. So a common case in Q region is that it's just a single rectangle and not an ellipse or so, which is then built up of uh, hundreds of rectangles. So um, typically when you deal with uh, regions, you iterate over the rectangles and then deal with them. So there's a Q vector of Q rect uh, function, a returning function called rects. But what if Q region wants to optimize that common case where the region is just a single rectangle and just save the single rectangle? Um, so what if Q region wants to use uh, small buffer optimization internally? And hint, it does. Um, the answer is it can't really because the interface ties it, the implementation to Q vector. Right. So this is cute, and you can say, okay, cute, 90s design, uh, why, what, why do I care? Uh, but we also find the same pattern in the standard library. And one thing that I vividly remember from EMBO discussions um, is this. Um, so error category, um, has a message method uh, that gives an int, that's the error code, and it returns what that error code means, right? And it's returned in a standard string. Now, error codes are, you can think of an alternative mechanism to exceptions. So it's, uh, it's understandable that people who don't want to use exceptions, like embedded folk, uh, would like to use error codes instead but they can't use error category because in a freestanding implementation there is no standard string because standard string allocates memory. So owning container means this otherwise perfectly okay class could uh, not be included in freestanding implementations. So how to solve this all? So we have seen two problems. The first one is that owning, cute uh, owning containers in APIs hinder interoperability. If I have my Q region rects, it returns a Q vector. If then I have some function uh, which uh, takes a standard vector instead, I can't call one without with the other because Q vector does not implicitly convert to standard vector. And even if it did, it would need to make a deep copy of the data. So two libraries, that should interoper interoperate, can't because they don't agree on the vocabulary types. In this case, what the vector is or supposed to be. Solution, um, use views for function arguments. Like in line seven here, we changed from using a standard vector to a standard span. And then um, I can call that function with anything that a standard span can uh, represent, including a Q vector. Um, line 10 there does not exactly work like that because um, the committee broke standard span. Um, if you pass it an R value, um, it will refuse to be implicitly converted. You need first need to store the R value container in, an, in a temporary, in a, in a variable to make it an L value, and then you can pass it. Uh, we'll, uh, I will have uh, something to say about that pattern in a second. But this, works otherwise. So the second problem is uh, that owning containers and APIs restrict the implementation. Um, we have said that QRegion wants to use um, a small buffer optimization where it just stores the single rectangle internally instead of having a vector of any kind of uh, rectangles, which is an ex additional external state it wants to avoid. So. Um, if I now just pass rects, the result of rects, um, to my function, fill rects, um, that works. 
Um, but internally, uh, QRegion needs to jump through quite some hoops to turn the one rectangle into a vector of rectangle. So it needs to allocate memory just to satisfy that API constraint or that API contract. So because back in the 90s and aughts when people cared about cycles and memory allocations, um, that came to light, people wrote this code um, in line 10 to 15 instead. So they found out that if you if the rect if the region contains just a single rectangle, that rectangle is of course the same as the bounding rectangle of the whole region. So they check does the region contain only one rectangle? If so, get me the bounding rectangle, construct a span from that one rectangle, call fill rects. Otherwise, it's okay to call rects because that will not allocate memory because it's already in a vector. So this API is not easy to use and it's easy to abuse, at least if you take efficiency into account. And um, people actually need to work around this and they need to know what the implementation actually does because maybe um, the small buffer optimization would extend to two, two rectangles, then this code would need to be changed and uh, would not have uh, the ability to use that bounding rect trick. So non-owning interface uh, idiom also solves this problem if you use it uh, if you use a view for return for returning function from a function. And the span does not care whether it's constructed over a single rectangle or over a Q vector or standard vector or C array. Um, so in any case, um, I can return a span representing either the single rectangle or the vector of rectangles from the same function. And I can do so in a no except fashion because I know that whatever I do, I don't need to allocate memory. And now the simple API in line eight works and is most efficient. And this is what I want to achieve um, in APIs um, that the easy case is also the most efficient case. So of course, uh, non-owning interface idiom has some limitations. It introduces lifetime issues. Um, if you look at line 10, um, I get a Q region from a function. So I have a temporary Q region and I call rects on it. And I immediately feed the result into fill rects. And that's okay. Everything is okay. Uh, the temporary is kept alive until the end of the full expression, which in this case involves the full call of to fill rects. Uh, but if I split the uh, line into two and store the rectangles first into a local variable, then by the time I have done so, the temporary object that is returned from the get rects function has been deleted by the compiler and rects, the span, uh, references um, deleted data. Some people think, like the authors of standard span, that you should just delete the R value overload. But this restricts users and the simple case in 11 in line 11 which was okay before and still is okay it just fails to compile and you force users to first store the Q region into a local variable and then call rects instead of the more comfortable way in in 11 in line 11 a line 12 is an error and it should be so that's okay but we have done too much we have Restricted, perfectly okay code. And it's not like this is a completely new issue. If you call a function that returns you a standard string and you call dot data on that standard string, you have exactly the same issue. You get a car star pointer to the, to the um, memory allocated by the standard, uh, standard string. And if the temporary is uh, still around and you access it, everything is okay. But if the temporary has been deleted, you're referencing deleted memory. So nothing new. So next try, um, how to fix the lifetime issue? Well, write a checker. It's not as simple as copying the um, declaration and deleting the R value overload, um, but it, 
more closely matches what the API should allow and what it should not allow. So forget about having to do everything in the API. Realize that there are these days tools, Clang, or in the in the cute case, uh, specialization of it, uh, Clazy, which are uh, there to um, encode these domain-specific uh, patterns or anti-patterns, warn about anti-patterns. Yeah. And a very general way to do this is uh, Herb Sutter's W lifetime work, um, which has been implemented, I believe, in Clang and in um, Visual Studio, I believe, not in GCC yet, um, which uh, tracks lifetime of reference data and so on, and um, should be able to, uh, to catch all these kinds of errors. So, um, the second issue is that views, of course, only work on over contiguous co it, uh, containers. So, here I uh, picked an abstract item model. It's an interface that you can implement to show your data in tree views and, uh, and table views like Excel-like uh, things in Qt. And one of the virtual methods that you can overload is a mapping between item roles that tells the, which type of item you want for a given cell and role names. Those are important in scripting languages in QML. And it returns it as an owning container, in this case as an unordered map, at QHash. Yeah, but that's non-contiguous, so I can't just replace it with a view. Views also only work if there's actual backing storage to return a view over. So if I take QString split, which uh, takes a string view and chops up the string into, um, into parts, um, along separators and returns me a vector of, uh, of those parts. Um, the vector of parts is contiguous, but it's calculated result. So there's no backing storage um, to that I could return a view over. So the solution to both of these uh, will be to use coroutines. So this finishes the first part um, of the talk. Um, if there are any questions uh, so far, please, uh, I see. So is it Qt or Qt? Um, marketing says Qt and developers say Qt. Okay, I won't wait for others just um, we'll take the rest of the questions at the end and um, just post them there in the Q&A tab. So um, how do you use, uh, how, sh how should we use coroutines uh, for um, this non-owning interface idiom version two? So another problem first, um, problem three, if you use owning containers in APIs, that means that you do any calculations eagerly. If I split a string, I uh, want to split a string and I call qString split, that will split the whole string. And only after the whole split string is split, I can get access to the first five parts or so that I want. So if I have uh, a loop over um, string split, and I use parts, use parts, use parts until I find some token that signals that um, I'm now done. Um, I will have split the whole, in this case, for example, a 100 megabyte file, um, even if the token appears on the third line. That's kind of wasteful. So um, here too, uh, coroutines can help if I replace the return value of the split function um, with a standard generator, which is something like for Go people a channel, um, that um, becomes a lazy sequence. So as I iterate over the generator, um, so you can observe that the code has not changed between the upper and the lower part. Um, only the return value has changed. Um, but because it's a standard generator, I have a lazy sequence and um, I'm backed by a coroutine. And therefore, as I iterate over the split result, I'm producing, I'm finding new parts. Now, I'm not iterating over the whole 
um, container, the whole string, producing parts and storing them away in an owning container. I return them, I yield them um, out of the coroutine one by one. Yeah. And therefore, if I, um, if I prematurely terminate that loop, I will not have produced more than I actually needed and consumed. And the nice thing is that um, adjusting the implementation from an owning container to a coroutine is absolutely trivial. So here's the implementation. Um, don't get bogged down in the details. Just pick out lines six and nine, where we push back to, into the result some parts that we have found. Yeah, and now happen, look what happens if I turn it into coroutine. It actually gets simpler because I don't need to deal with the um, result container manually. I just co-yield whenever I find something. Yeah. Um, you can implement this without coroutines. I tried, I did, and I succeeded. It's 450 lines of code uh, for that function. And the heart of that is, is this, again, do not get bogged down in the details. Just look at line three, nine, and 14. This chops up the function into three parts and it's three states. Basically, this is a state machine that implements um, the tokenization. And uh, it's exactly what the compiler does um, for you if you do use coroutines. So, but here I need to do it manually. That's C++ 11 code. And it's not fun to write. Of course, uh, this uh, Q-string tokenizer does a bit more than the coroutine um, string split that we have seen so far. Um, it, for example, has no allocations at all, um, whereas the coroutine will um, allocate the, um, the frame, the coroutine frame on the, on the heap. And it also implements R value ping, pinging, pinning. That means there are no ding, dangling references because when I have been given an R value Q string, for example, or standard string, I move that into my tokenizer, into my promise, into my return type, and thereby keep it alive for the duration of the loop. Um, so if you can't use coroutines yet, um, I'll probably just write 500 lines of code or implement a for each X. So coroutines um, a yielding coroutine is basically calling a callback. It's a bit more complicated than that. Coroutines are more flexible, but you can emulate the behavior for generators at least. So we can implement the whole thing with um, callbacks. So we give it a callback on line three, start function. And then instead of co-yielding in line seven and uh, line 10, I just call the callback with my string view and I can use it as in line 15. Um, does this throw? Yes, because of standard function. Do we know how to make it not throw? Yes, of course, but it will look a bit more complicated. Um, but this is a fallback solution. I would not recommend this uh, for anything except for really high performance uh, critical code, and then of course not with standard function. Um, but this is basically what every SCL algorithm does. Yeah with a standard function, but with a template argument, um, but that's how to customize a SCL algorithm. So back to the limitations of coroutines. Um, they have their own set of dangling pointer problems. Um, for example, consider um, a split function um, coroutine that is now um, working on standard string instead of Q string. So I get a standard string in, a character separator, just to keep it simple, and return a generator of string views. And now I have in 9.11 that uh, simple code where I pass a string literal. And I, of course, I expect that I use first uh, the hello and then the world. Um, but that's not so. Because um, since the split function takes a standard string, the hello world string literal is first converted into a temporary standard string that is being passed to the coroutine. And the coroutine immediately suspends um, because it's a generator. Um, it immediately suspends before it does any work. 
And because it's a reference parameter, the reference is copied, but not the data. So by the time we go out of the split function and uh, we enter the loop, um, that temporary will be destroyed and we will be looping over deleted data. Of course, we all wish that range-based for loops were defined like this instead of the way they are defined. Uh, maybe we'll get there at some point. But um, until then, that's what we have to live for. And range-based for loop is just one problem we have. We can trivially rewrite the code in line 11 to 13 here. And we have the same problem even if the for loop was wrapped in a lambda to extend the lifetime of its uh, of the right hand side argument. Yeah. So this really is something that screams for a solution in C++ uh, itself and not at the API level. Um, so something like W lifetime or whatever else is brewing in the standardization committee at the moment. Um, so my recommendation would be to ignore the issue until we know how to solve it in a general case and not try to delete R-value overloads and stuff like that um, in every API that we write. And of course, don't forget uh, star this. Yeah, If I have a function that returns a string and I call split on the return value of the function, I have exactly the same problem um, just on the this pointer. So why is this the case? Why do we have this problem? The problem is that generators suspend always on initial suspend because they don't want to find um, the first token until they are asked to by a call to begin on the generator. Um, so because they initially suspend, that means I can write no code in the function body that is executed before the initial suspension. And that means I cannot write any code in the function body to st store away the uh, function arguments, make copies of them or something like that. Yeah. So the recommendation usually is to um, pass by value because then the arguments live on the frame of the coroutine and it's all automatic. But we wanted to avoid having owning containers in the API. And here I'm presenting it as a solution. So that's not going to fly. So one way to solve the issue is to pass arguments by value and then get the automatic lifetime extension. If that is not possible, for example, for star this prior to C++ 23, we need a custom promise type. And that custom promise type needs to have a constructor that matches the function's argument list. And if, there, if the compiler finds such a constructor in the promise type, it will invoke it with the function arguments. So there we have a, a point where we can grab control over the function arguments and store them away. But this, of course, ties the promise type to a specific coroutine because every coroutine will have different requirements. And this proliferation of promise types means that there is more work in, implement in implementing them, in documenting them, and for the user in learning them, even though, of course, they all share the same a interface. They're just a range. The gold standard so far that I have found for me is to wrap the coroutine, which acts only on views, in, ordinary function, in an ordinary function overload set, which uh, does all the conversion. So if it's getting an R value owner, it will store that um, into the return value or into the generator or into the promise type and thereby pin it, uh, pin its lifetime to the lifetime of the generator. Um, if you want to know how to do this um, manually, uh, you can look at the implementation of QString tokenizer. Um, there's also this uh, blog article on the website of my former employer uh, where I explain um, a bit how to do this, but uh, not in detail. And of course, doing so implies that different functions from this overload set, um, which appear or are designed to appear to the user as a single function, 
um, have different return values and therefore callers of the function must receive the return value in an auto variable or at least if it's all the same template uh, with C++17 con class template argument deduction. So leaving out the template arguments. Next issue is that of re-entrance. If I have a normal function that just puts stuff into a vector, returns the vector, um, that function cannot be recursed into, at least not from the same thread. Multi-threading is a whole different beast and we're not talking about that here. So when a coroutine is suspended, however, other code is running. That's the whole point. We put the coroutine to the side so that we can run other code in the meantime. And that code could potentially call into the suspended coroutine. That's not a problem as such, because every coroutine invocation gets their own frame. So at least uh, different coroutine invocations don't clobber each other's uh, frame state, local variables. But you do, however, call an unbounded set of uh, code while your coroutine is suspended. But again, this is nothing new. It's just like invoking callbacks. If you invoke a callback, you also must assume that the called code recurses into your, or re-enters re re your function. And uh, you need to put recursion guards and whatever you know um, how to deal with this issue there in, in order to um, avoid um, re-entrancy problems. It's also to a lesser extent the same as calling a virtual function because you do not control the re-implementation of virtual functions. So they too can recurse into the into your function. And the same is true for signal slot connections, which are just a fancy way of callbacks, of using callbacks. So treat suspension points as you would invocations of callbacks or virtual functions, and you should be on the safe side. Don't forget, however, about the initial suspend, which is hidden in the code. So there's no, no co-yield, no co-await for this. It's just as you enter the function, it's immediately suspended if you're using a generator. Uh, important also to keep resources in right objects uh, across suspension points. Uh, because if your, um, if your coroutine handle um, is destroyed, uh, because uh, for example, um, we stop tokenizing because we found what we need and we just exit the for loop. Um, then the coroutine is being destroyed and um, as uh, the coroutine is being destroyed, the stack frame is unwound as if by the throw of an exception, except that I can't catch the exception. Uh, and um, if you have newed something and then suspend and then later assign it to some owner, then you have leaked memory. So, next issue is coroutine frame allocation. I said that the compiler will allocate um, the coroutine frame on the heap. That frame is used for function arguments, the promise object, um, local variables, and selected temporaries that are held uh, alive across suspension points. And compilers um, are sometimes able to elide the memory allocation, at least Clang is. Uh, for example, see Gorn Nishamov's uh, talk from C++ Con 2016, where he has his magic disappearing coroutines. But that likely um, requires all the code in between the creation and the destruction of the coroutine handle to be visible to the compiler. That means no atomics because compilers forget all they know about um, memory when they encounter an atomic operation, no out-of-line function calls, um, and so on. That's very hard to do, especially in Qt, where most of the stuff, uh, most of the code spend an API boundary. So the coroutine frame allocation can, of course, we're in C++, we can get control of everything, can be overwritten by a custom allocation function, just like any other function uh, class. Um, I need to do this on the promise object for the compiler to find it. And then I can, for example, use a pool allocator to at least um, um, reduce the overhead of, of, the, of the frame allocation. Careful here, the coroutines can be resumed and destroyed on a different thread than they were created. 
That's not likely for generators though. Bottom line, coroutines can't really be no except because they always have some allocation inside. One thing that I did not look at, so it's untested, um, but it's worth a try, is uh, whether caller supplied storage um, can help here. Um, you probably don't know CSS because I invented it um, not too long ago. Um, it works by providing a default argument the, um, at the end of the function um, that supplies some storage. Could be a standard vector, could be a Q string, and in this case, it's just a flat array of car, of course, 42 um, characters. And um, we intend to place the frame into the storage. We cannot allocate on the stack or as an automatic variable storage inside the function but we can force, uh, by doing it this way, we can force the caller of the function to allocate memory in its stack frame. And storage such allocated will at least uh, survive until the end of the full expression, which may be enough. And if it's not enough, I need to pass something um, manually that I, that I uh, created manually on the stack. This is incredibly powerful. Um, and um, we are using it in Qt already on QAnystringView string view um, to store some, some stuff that uh, we could not otherwise store where we just don't have any storage. And um, I also intend to use this for, for number formatting and stuff like that. It's just a very powerful idiom. The problem here is that I have not yet found out for myself whether this actually works. Um, I can use that storage which comes in as a function argument um, to um, uh, to place the promise and with it the whole frame in it. Independent of that of course I need to know how much storage I need to supply. That's another issue. But this is worth something looking into. So finally uh, coroutines do not provide random access. Uh, they can't go back, only forward. So generator types are input iterators, or input ranges. Um, but what if you need more? What if you need random or bi-directional access? Or where, with what, whether, what if you need better than linear complexity? Provide a, additional API. Just um, it, not having a better than linear lookup if your underlying data is is able to provide this just means that in elements of programming Stepanov's book um, speak you do not have you have a base of operations but it's not an efficient base of operation and you should have an efficient base of operations so that uh, you can do all the things that uh, you want to do with your class in the most efficient way possible so Coming back to this example from the abstract item model, that interface that I can implement to plug my data into, into two views and so on. Um, I can return uh, from role names, I can return a lazy sequence that works regardless of how the data is actually stored, even if it's generated on the fly, that works. And um, for the cases where I have an item role, that's just an enum, and I want to look to look up the role name for that, I just provide an extra function and that extra function is uh, constant complexity, whereas of course iterating over the role names would be linear complexity. So summary, coroutines as an API principle. What have we learned? Coroutines can help avoiding to use owning containers in API. That's where I started. And since coroutines are ordinary functions, they can be virtual functions and they can be DLL exported. In other words, they are usable in APIs. Because they are normal functions, the magic is in the return type. These return type, of course, uh, need to be exposed in the API. And that's where the problem comes. We have conflicting requirements here. On the one hand, we want as few promise types and therefore return types from coroutines as possible because that makes it easier to learn 
to implement and to document. Like we have standard future, let's all use only standard future. Uh, no. And but that requires type erasure, and type erasure means memory allocation. I think I will look at Klaus' uh, talk um, in meeting C++ here to see uh, whether he has any better ideas that uh, of type erasure that don't require memory allocation. We'll see. On the other hand, fine tuning behavior like the allocation, the argument pinning, and so they, that requires protein promise types. And that means having different return values, return types. And of course, inline functions, which is also something that you should be very careful about if you are working in something like Qt, which has strong binary compatibility requirements. Inline functions are sometimes necessary uh, to get the performance because the abstractions are so trivial that you cannot afford going behind an API boundary with them. But it must be a conscious decision to do so, to inline that stuff. What else have we learned? Coroutines can help with implementing lazy sequences. Of course, that is one of the raison d'etre uh, for, uh, for coroutines in the first place, the generator pattern. And that, of course, leads to less work wasted when I only need a subset of the results. It's very easy to implement compared to traditional techniques that require state machines like QString tokenizer. And once you start looking, lazy sequences are everywhere, like literally, literally everywhere. What else have we learned? Coroutines, of course, come with their own set of issues. This is C++ and um, there is no golden apple. Um, there's always some dark hole where, uh, where an insect is coming out. So we've seen issues one and four, that was lifetime dangling references. Nothing new, again, just different disguise of the same underlying problem, lifetime issues, dangling references. Issues three, uh, two and seven were um, dealing with the fact that either your data is stored and contiguously so, then you return a view and have random access, or not, then you use a coroutine, but however, you only have an input range then, no longer random access. Uh, we have seen the issue of re-entrancy of uh, frame allocation. And with that, I thank you and I'm open for question. Please visit our booth um, on the show. Yeah, thank you, Mark, for the excellent talk. I learned a lot. And we have two questions um, kind of simple questions. The one was that, that was uploaded is uh, on slide 13 and 14. If you want to go back, uh, mm. what happens if you split, uh, to your split, if somebody captures the result into the lambda and uses the lambda as a slot? Can this lead to memory corruption and will the compiler find this or will it just work? So, lambda capture is nothing different from just storing it into some variable. And we have seen um, somewhere here how this can go wrong. Right? Um, and uh, I've also talked about what are things to do to avoid this, meaning if you get an R value, you need to store it internally. Um, the problem with slots is, in general, is uh, that uh, you need to be careful um, what you store in there, especially by reference. If you store something in the Lambda, everything is okay by value. Um, but if you take references, um, you need to make sure that they are kept alive for the duration of the connection, um, the Qt connection. Um, so for those who don't know Qt so well, um, this is a question about signal slot connections in Qt, where signals are basically a notify of an, an observer pattern and slot is um, the observer that can be connected to the si signal. 
and receives the data. And um, since Qt5, you can connect lambdas as slots. You don't need functions anymore. You can connect a lambda. And those lambdas, of course, can have state. And that state can be by reference or captured by reference or by value. By value, everything is OK. Uh, by reference, you need to make sure that um, what you refer to in the lambda lives at least as long as the connection. And those things are completely orthogonal to each other. Um, so um, you just need to follow both rules, both sets of rules. Okay. Thank you. Um, the, the last question uh, is, what do you think about a, a function signature uh, fill rects with auto input range rectangles? I guess it's a... That that works, of course. If you can make it a template, um, that works. Um, the idea here is to go behind an AP, IP, API boundary. So to have something that's DLL exported out of line. And um, if, you do, uh, if you do that with uh, templates, um, you can only do this for a certain number of instantiations that you know ahead of time, and then you um, instantiate them in the CPP file in the library, and all other instantiations will not find the definition. Um, so this is an, a closed set of options that you have there, even though uh, it's a template, as long as you want to keep the implementation behind the API, bound, uh, API boundary. And um, my concern here is uh, not so much about um, inline code, like STL algorithms um, or ranged, uh, range algorithms in C++20, uh, because the compiler can see everything. Um, what's important uh, for Qt and for other such libraries, which are traditionally shipped um, with most of the code out of line, is that you can efficiently cross the ABI boundary or the API boundary. So yeah, that um, is of course simple. Just plug in an input range, uh, plug it into a for loop and do whatever you want. Uh, but it's a template, so it gets instantiated um, for every new range that you pass. Okay, thank you. Then there's the next question uh, by Peter. Isn't the generator easily done even in C++ 98? Using iterator with virtual next method, doing all the work. Yeah, it's basically that uh, function that I showed you from uh, QString tokenizer. It's the next function. Um, what makes uh, this more complicated is uh, that it's actually doing the pinning of our value references and so on. And this cannot be done in C plus plus ninety eight because a function um, in Qt it's called Q tokenize or member function tokenize, um, returns different return types depending on what you return, um, uh, what you give as arguments. So if you give it a, a standard string, um, L value, it will not store the standard string because it's an L value, so it assumes that it uh, will stay around for as long as the stroke string tokenizer stays around. If you give it a start string R value, it will store it internally, and that makes the QString tokenizer that is being returned from um, the tokenized method a different thing. It now has a standard string member into which the um, into which the argument has been moved. And the same is true for QString. Um, if you get an R value, it's being moved in, and um, if you get an L value, you just store uh, store the view um, over the data, and then do the same thing not only for the haystack but also for the needle, and you can maybe grasp where all the complexity comes from. Okay, then there's a question from Jens, related by Dennis, uh, asking if your uh, color site storage optimization isn't just a manual. Uh, in RVO, uh, so return time no, it's optimization? Um, NRVO is uh, just, um, so it's named return value optimization. Um, that is, um, if I create a temporary um, 
inside the fun or a local variable inside my function and the compiler can prove that this object is the one that's being returned from all return um, statements then instead of copy constructing that local into the return value of the function it will construct the temporary into the place of the return value in the first place thereby saving the copy construction um, or move construction uh, CSS instead is uh, concerned about um, obtaining storage from the caller um, you can of course always put that storage into the return value um, and uh, thereby get the same effect if an RVO kicks in but um, CSS works also if the return value you cannot change the return value for example um, if you want to format a number uh, an integer number you know how many digits it maximally can have so you can allocate storage for that and then you can allocate that storage either in the return value um, and you have something like a Q formatted number which internally contains as many characters as are necessary to format any integer number and that implicitly for example converts to Q string, Q string view and so on but that is not a Q string view it's something that implicitly converts to it if um, you want to have a function that actually returns a QString view then that does not work because the QString view is a type that you do not control and you cannot just add storage to QString view to to um, enable your use case so in this case you can pass a std array of car 16t and a sufficient size like I did let me get back the slide um, there, there we go yep um, you allocate um, you take this extra argument and you just store the result in the storage and then you return a view over that storage yeah, that's the trick with uh, uh, caller supplied storage and um, the the idea here is that um, you can use CSS even if you can't use the return value for example in a constructor a constructor does not have a return value so you cannot just put something else into it um, but with this additional argument you can supply um, storage for um, for example converting whatever a car 32 uh, t into a pair of car 16 t which then a string view can store um, that is highly dangerous I know I know I know um, but um, I use it in Qt only on Q any string view which is designed as a pure interface type it's only uh, designed to be um, a type for function argument and in that case it's safe because I can pass car 32 T's to a function that takes a Q any string view that internally decomposes the thing into two car 16 T's and stores pointer to those variables and those um, two variables they come from um, caller supplied storage Well, that's a good question I really had to argue <laughs> in my head to find out why uh, CSS is not just an RVO. okay thanks again Mark for the excellent talk on answering all the questions okay. and uh, it was mentioned that the QT company has a uh, booth so join this uh, on the, on the, this room on the and then there's also uh, extended q a if you have any more questions you want to discuss and more uh, details then join the lounge uh, chair group for track a and i hope to see you over there and we can discuss the uh, 
CSS and, and, and we are all in more detail if you want. So thanks again, Mark. Then see you. You're welcome. Just skipping through the chat.